TV. Welcome everybody, my name is Leon van Roy and this is a new episode of Playgrounds TV In Depth. We do bi-weekly interviews with several studios and important people out of the industry and interesting. Um, and this time we have a really special couple, the founders of Catching Cartoons. Uh, Erik and Joost, welcome in my studio. Hello. Hey, welcome. Hey, yeah. thank you for having us. Yes, yes. no, I'm so happy that uh, we can work it out like this because in, uh, actually you would have been here in the studio, but unfortunately we live in this kind of pandemic. Uh, so because of quarantine, we have to solve it like this. But in a way, you feel in front of my table and uh, it feels like we are in a pub. Um, mm -hmm. While preparing, I selected 120 slides. So we have quite some material to discuss. And we really want to hear everything about you and the story behind Kaching. But to give the audience an impression, we're first going to look at the showreel to, to see what Kaching is on. Well, that's a wonderful introduction to a lot of projects uh, in the, from the past years. Um, a huge amount of work. Um, but before we dive a little bit more deeper in those separate projects, um, how, where, cause, where does the love for cartoons and animation come from, uh, Joost? Ooh, uh, I think it has always been there. It's, uh, uh, when I was a little kid, I remember that I always wanted to draw or play uh, with Playmobil, Lego toys, tell stories. And uh, I was reading comic books and loving television uh, films. And uh, I think as far as I can remember, I always said I want to be an artist when I'm big. And uh, in artist, I was, I meant drawing comics or cartoons. It's, uh, and and then you actually you always drawing from childhood on, and then went to art academy. Yes, I uh, I wanted to go to art academy, so my teachers told me which kind of uh, level school I needed. Uh, it was Havo, so I first did my Mavo and then my Havo. Then uh, my teachers at school said that I should study graphic design, and I didn't know, so I tried uh, studying graphic design, and it was not what I was looking for. Uh, so I uh, quit Art Academy and I went to this uh, private school. It was a, a night school called the Cartoon School in Amsterdam. Um, 
I learned there for two years uh, about cartoons and animation and went to work at an animation studio in Rotterdam afterwards as an ink and paint and a cleanup artist. And then found out that, uh, that, that there were studies, studies for animation and uh, even close by in Rotterdam, there was the Willem de Koning Academy, uh, which has had an animation study. And I went back to uh, school right. to study animation because I, I liked uh, all the parts of, uh, of the studio, was called the Den Draak Studios, Animation World yeah. later. And, uh, but, but I found out that I didn't want, necessarily wanted to do the cleanup and ink and paint uh, scanning parts, but I wanted to do what the director was doing. So wanted to tell the stories. I want to tell the story. Hey, and, and Eric, uh, also uh, Playmobil, Lego and drawing? Uh, very much so, yeah. I think I had a really short policeman phase for, <laughs> for a year or two. So from police <laughs> school was... straight to the animation department. Yes, and then, uh, then yeah, from, from being a little kid, I always uh, was drawing, uh, making little comics and... Uh, uh, I didn't know those uh, thumb films, you oh, know, yeah, when you yeah, make yeah. a little stack of papers and you go like... Brrr. Flip books. Flip books, right. I always was making flip books. And uh, I did uh, the, the VWO. And there my teachers always said, if you want to go uh, do something with art, you have to do a lot of German and French <laughs> <laughs> for some reason. Uh, so when I uh, finished uh, uh, that, that school, I went also to the, the Willem de Koning. And and that's also the place where you both met. Yes. Yeah. Yes. And can can you tell us a bit about that, uh, Eric? Okay. Uh, in the first year, it was a really uh, a diverse year. So you just went to art school, and even though you already kind of knew that you wanted to do animation, there was this this year uh, in which you can switch easily to other directions. And so we only had one morning of animation in the first year. <laughs> <laughs> one morning in the whole year? And now one morning per week. Whoa, okay. <laughs> and, uh, but yeah, it was totally clear for me that I wanted to do uh, animation. Uh, and Joost was also in that class. And uh, uh, how, how it went was the teacher, he always picked uh, little groups to do uh, anim animation projects together so that you can do uh, a, a li little bit bigger projects. And at some point I accused the teacher of never putting me and Joost together in the, in the same group because uh, probably you would say uh, that is not true, but he always take one motivated animator, one medium motivated uh, animator and one a really not motivated animator to put them together in a group and I said uh, that's not fair and then he said okay it's not true you uh, but you can make the groups this time and then I said okay I'm going with Joost <laughs> <laughs> and uh, yeah that, that clicked uh, super well and uh, I think pretty much from that moment we did a lot of projects together yeah yes almost every project <laughs> Okay, and, and was it also like when graduating at school, was it also like a, a shared graduation project or did you... Yes, yes. We, we did everything together, basically. So we had two internships. Uh, we did an internship at Arjan Wilschut, yeah. Animation Works. Yeah. Uh, we did that together. Then we did a second internship at the Cartoon Saloon, which we also did together. And then we went back uh, to Rotterdam, to the Willem de Koning, and did our uh, graduation film uh, together. Hey, and uh, you already mentioned Cartoon Saloon. I think um, everybody will know them from The Secret of Kells, Wolfwalkers. They are a famous uh, studio in Ireland. Um, uh, I think you got a lot of knowledge over there, right? About uh, how to set up a story. Uh, because uh, what I heard in an earlier conversation, you learned a lot over there of the whole process of making films. Was that like an important step in your career, doing that internship? Hugely, really, really important. Uh, we were lucky that like the Cartoon Saloon is now an enormous studio with hundreds of people and a, and a second studio like uh, Lighthouse it's called, which is also a bit of a part of, uh, 
the cartoon saloon. But when we went there, the cartoon saloon was really tiny. I think like five eight people. Or, yeah. No, it was eight. I think eight people. Yeah. And they had two productions. It was the the Secret of Kells and uh, Skunk Fu. And because it was such a, a, a small studio back then, you you could have uh, a lot of conversations with everybody. Yet. And and I think now that they're so big, it's more distant to talk to the supervisors. And yes. and that way we we uh, got a lot of uh, well. Uh, close connection to, to the people working there and, and see uh, really how, the, how they do their work. So I think we pretty much uh, stole their way of work <laughs> that we learned on Skunk Fu. So we did an internship on, on, uh, on Brandon and Secret of Kells and Skunk Fu. And after graduating, we went back to the Cartoon Saloon to work there for a year on that show, Skunk Fu. And Joost did the uh, designs and I did storyboards. And uh, there was this line producer next to us and there was a BG supervisor sitting next to Joost and behind them was the director. And we were all sitting in the same area so we could constantly hear what they do and how they do it. And we could ask them uh, pretty much anything. Yeah, and mingle in the conversation. So, and they led us, which was kind yeah. of cool. Yeah. And that, I think that's really interesting that you got that opportunity because you also, but maybe I'm wrong, you learn how to work in a small team with really quick lines and even though able to make beautiful series and productions, is that also what you brought with you to the Netherlands when starting off Kaching? Yeah, that and also a lot of connections because even though the studio uh, was small, it was already growing and uh, by then, they were already working with the uh, Canadian, like in the studio, there were all these nationalities, people from Canada, people from Denmark. Yes, well, uh, w when we got back after our internship, after our graduation, we got back there for a year. The studio had grown from eight people to 80 people. So it grown really big and there were all these people over there from all over the world and uh, really got to learn all these people personally. And then they were working with people on remote. And uh, that gave us a big team of people uh, which we could work with when we started Kaching as well. Yeah, you, you have immediately you have an international network of very yeah. talented people that also could be hired for your own projects or collaborations or give you the information needed. Because yeah. I can imagine when you are looking at Cartoon Saloon, which is a great example about like how a little studio can be really successful and, and, and making uh, like world famous films. Um, and then coming to the Netherlands, which is a total different, or maybe it's the same, like in a bit, because like Iron Jaws had done blood, now you have Cartoon Saloon, but in the Netherlands, it's a different kind of industry. In that sense, Kaching had to make their own pathway in it because you did quite some big projects. How, what was your first step in the Dutch animation studio? Of, uh, sorry, Dutch animation industry. I think um, when we left Cartoon Saloon, the production of Skunk Fu, the part where we were working on storyboards, designs, the, was finished. Uh, and we said we're going to the Netherlands. We, uh, When we were in Ireland, we won a pitch for the Rotterdam Film Fund to start our own first short film, uh, the 3D machine. So we knew when we come back, we can work on, on our first film. And also uh, the Cartoon Saloon gave us a few assignments uh, to do. So they let us work uh, as a studio. They gave us basically our first uh, jobs. Uh, they, they gave us a part of special animation for Skunk Fu. They gave us, uh, uh, they asked us if we would want to do a pilot for a new series, uh, Eskachin Cartoons. And then in the Netherlands also, uh, because we quickly left after graduation, we only went on holidays uh, in summer and then we went to Ireland and left there, lived there for a year. Uh, but a lot of people seen our graduation film and uh, they asked us if we come by, visit them uh, and meet up. Uh, so we immediately did that when we came back. Uh, so we, we met with Pedri, which we made George and Paul later with. We met with, uh, with Shop Around, which became our agency for commercial jobs. Uh, so we were actually immediately busy. Uh, so you learn to keep moving, etc. And you also got in touch with the Efteling, 
yes. which is a famous theme park in the Netherlands, uh, uh, visited by millions in, uh, in, in not during the pandemic, but uh, it's a, like a really uh, uh, yeah, famous theme park. And you start working on, and, and I, for me it's difficult, but the furry brawls, I know them as Krobbebolle, which was like a kind of a cult series out of my youth uh, called Tita Tovenaar. Um, and you started to work also for the Efteling uh, doing this. Can you tell me a little bit more about that project? Uh, yeah. Yes. Um, we, uh, the Efteling had acquired a very old TV show called Tita Tovenaar, uh, and they bought all the rights and they were remaking it. And there were two hand puppets in that show. And uh, they wanted to make a funny cartoon show uh, about the two hand puppets. Uh, and they really wanted Tom and Jerry kind of like fun uh, short episodes, 26. And uh, we were actually very lucky and loved our way in a bit. Uh, it's, uh, it's a funny story. After we finished our, uh, our, our, our 3D machine film, we decided we want to do a longer film. Uh, and we said we want to make an animated opera about cockroaches. And we were pitching that to people. And it was about uh, cockroaches making a, using an atomic bomb because they would be the only ones who would survive. So it makes sense that they are the only ones that should use it. Uh, so we were pitching it to people and to broadcasters. And a broadcaster came by from the Avro Tros and she said, I really like it. I will discuss this with my other people. And uh, uh, that project didn't become uh, we did, never made that project, but two days later, we got a phone call from the Efteling saying like, uh, I'm sitting here uh, and we want to make this cartoon show. And uh, Avro Tross just uh, told us that uh, they think you are really fit to make the series. <laughs> uh, and they said, you must have worked a lot with them because they were very fond of you. And we said, who was it? Oh, oh yes, she, yes. she visited our studio. The, just the other day. <laughs> we consider her as our sister. Yeah, yeah. Yes. Yeah, yeah. So, so, so we so had we one kinda... talk with her and uh, by that time, I think we were still very, very young and uh, our studio was literally my bedroom, <laughs> which we had uh, the head of the uh, kids program uh, from the Avro Tros come by, <laughs> which sounds a bit silly now, but it, uh, yeah, but it proved a big uh, success because she talked to the Efteling about it. She's perfect sales uh, for you. Yeah. 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 So we have a lot of uh, thanks. Thanks to her, we got got the gig. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. We, we're going to watch a little little short clip. Um... <laughs> yeah, because with, with this clip, and then we go to George and Paul, um, you said it was like quite, quite, quite a big project uh, uh, kicking off. And of course, you worked a lot with uh, Cartoon Saloon and you did uh, other projects before. But I can imagine like working on such big series already, um, um, there, there is a kind of efficiency. So how did you develop your team and set it up your studio back then? Oh, yeah. So that's that's the part where we took everything from the cartoon saloon. <laughs> yes, <laughs> right. I, I can imagine. That was yeah. already where the experience yeah. comes in. Yeah, so we made all the, the animatics uh, ourselves. Uh, we had the head of, uh, of the lead uh, background artist from the cartoon saloon from the Skunk Fu show do all the backgrounds by himself. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, all the animation was done... Uh, by a Canadian studio, which we uh, also learned uh, through yeah. the Cartoon Saloon. It, it was made, yeah, the, the, the Canadians, uh, just the Coyote animation, he was the head of animation at the, at the show we worked on in Ireland. And he also went back to his home country and started up his own studio and he wanted jobs for that. And, and they, they had a lot of experienced Flash animators because this was a Flash show. And uh, he had a lot of TV shows made in Flash back then. Uh, so he, we had to make 26 episodes in nine months, I think. So we really could use a, a very experienced crew in that. And uh, basically we, we divided the work up the same way we did it in, uh, in Ireland. And, uh, and we worked with all those people. And I think uh, that worked really well. So, 
a lot of experience from Cartoon Saloon, a lot of experience by doing your own series in, in nine months, which is like a lot. Yeah, it's a lot of work, I can imagine. Um, then quite quickly afterwards came George and Paul, which had a total different kind of technique, and it was also a series. So what was the changement of technique, the why swapping? I can imagine you feel comfortable in that 2D kind of pipeline, you know the people uh, you already mentioned before, and then a new project in a total different kind of approach. Um, tell me a bit more about the idea and the why of this uh, style. Yes, uh, it started uh, really before that, uh, the idea of George and Paul. Um, it's actually uh, a graduation film, was uh, called The Shoebox, and uh, it was uh, it was not in stop motion because we didn't have the time, so we made it in CG. People mistaked it for stop motion, which was funny, because afterwards we made a real stop motion series, and people always think it's CG. Uh, but that that show, uh, we we put a trailer online and we sent it around to some websites. And at that time, it was 2006, 2005. Uh, the internet was not that big as as it is now. Uh, but it immediately got featured on, on different sites like Cartoon Brew and that was great for us and they all wrote about it and immediately our uh, our email box, we, we got emails from people who were interested in the project and uh, we got an email from Disney which was very special for us because we were still students and uh, getting an email from Disney with a request, we saw this, we like it, can you develop, do you have more ideas for uh, for preschool shows? Uh, so we were really happy uh, and thought of other concepts and the shoebox sounded very, uh, very good. So we thought of the block box, <laughs> <laughs> the block of those in Dutch. And uh, it's basically because we thought, oh, okay, we made the shoebox, now we make a block box. And that's where the, the idea of George and Paul came from. And we wanted to make it something that literally everybody in the world would know. Uh, if you cannot make it from an existing toys because you don't have the licensing, the license of it. So we thought of what is something that everybody knows and, and we can use. And then we thought like, well, I play with, played with wooden blocks. My kids now play with wooden blocks. Uh, my father played with wooden blocks. His grandfather played with wooden blocks. Uh, it's kind of timeless and everybody knows it. And that's basically how we came up with the concept of uh, of yeah. using wooden blocks. But we were not a, a stop motion studio, of course. Uh, so first, I think we did all these 2D designs and Joost did some 3D tests. Uh, but like Joost already uh, earlier said, uh, that we were also invited uh, by P3 Animation to uh, do a cup of coffee. And then Thomas Hietbrink, who was uh, the producer back then, he asked if we had projects that were suitable for stop motion. And then, he, ah, we're yes. going to show George and Paul. <laughs> yes. What a coincidence. Yeah. yeah. Well, it, it was also before we weren't really happy about the designs. It was not what we wanted it to be. And at a certain moment, I made just a photo of a few wooden blocks and I showed it to Eric. I said, it should look like this. And then we tried to make that. But then we came to the conclusion it's, if it should look like this, why are we not just using wooden blocks and photograph them? And that's, of course, stop motion. All right. Here, here, here I can see like a little storyboard animatic and the final pilot. So that you can see how it, everything is built with, with the blocks. Welcome to the world of George and Paul. A world where they have many great adventures. Today, George and Paul are going to do a very dangerous stunt. But George seems a bit scared. Oh no! George is going to crash! Good thinking, Paul. Oh no! Quick, Paul! 
put him back together. Ah, much better. You can also really nicely see the potential of animation in this, right? So, like you, you have like this few building blocks, and you can build worlds with it. And if you are moving them cleverly, you can transform in one to another. So it was really playful, and I can imagine that for preschool, it's also like triggering imagination. So it's uh, beautifully stylistic. But I can imagine that it's also quite difficult to direct it, right? Or was it also that because you saw the the storyboard and it's really clear? So it it really I can imagine that it's really important to when you're working with other studios, it's quite an intensive project to, to produce with, with series in this kind of stop motion technique. Yeah, I think the, the, the animatic like you just saw, that is pretty much how we always work. Uh, they're not the prettiest ones to look at, but they are very exact timed, uh, even with little pupil movements and blinks. <laughs> it's all in there, so it's almost like animated, but uh, like really rough looking and timed exactly. Uh, I think a lot of stop motion films, uh, they work not with so strict uh, storyboards or just like untimed storyboards and an animator can animate the scene and then they cut it to make it uh, the, uh, right for that uh, for the shot. But what we do as a director is really make a super strict uh, animatic so that the animator knows in how, how many frames he has to do the shot and what, what exactly must happen. And if we work like that, uh, even though we were not uh, stop motion animators, we can have a lot of, uh, well, uh, directing uh, on the shots. So it doesn't really matter if we do stop motion or 3D or uh, 2D, uh, yeah, I think and the, the, the storyboarding animatic uh, part is a, is a really big part where you can decide uh, what the style is and uh, what the shots you, you do and uh, what kind of humor and timing uh, is, in the, is in the show. Yeah, I, I can see your skills that you, improve, uh, that you developed in, 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 the, um, in the animatics, in the storyboard, moving storyboards. Because sometimes I see a lot and there is like still a lot to fill in, but you are filling in all the gaps, right? So even like little movements just to make really clear camera directions, angles, expressions, like uh, uh, all that kind of stuff. It's already in in the moving yes. storyboard or in the animatic. Yeah. On, on George and Paul, uh, there were, uh, was, was all built at Pedri, uh, all, all the puppets, all the sets, and it was all animated in Belgium at Beast Animation. And they were animating on six uh, six tables at the same time, and they they didn't have to do it before. But now they had really they had papers which really said like this has to be 146 frames, and and things like that. But they also I, what I have heard is that they thought it was really nice and really helpful for the animators because they knew exactly what we wanted, and that's uh... yeah. And stop motion is a very painstaking process eh? you start a shot and then you finish it and if it's not good you do it over which is not uh, what producers want uh, <laughs> in in a tv show uh, doing whole scenes over so yeah uh, it was very clear to the to the animator uh, what was needed for the shot yeah but what i really like also how you combined like 2d with 3d like these kind of effects you re really know it from cartoon lip sync and expressions facial expressions and then translate them on the faces of the of the block so that actually also all your um, yeah, the tricks and traits from uh, uh, 2d and stop motion came together really nicely um and what i thought is a really nice quality of it and i think it, it's all in the, the directing hands of, of you both is that it looks so lively. It's not like a stiff kind of blocks because you can imagine that sometimes blocks, they are like quite stiff, static yes. elements, but the way you animated it and the whole world comes together in that kind of pace of cartooning. So it was normally stop motion can be really like puppeteering, but these were really a way of, um, how do you say, um, uh, bringing stop motion and cartoon together and make it give it the living list living list i don't know if that's good english <laughs> word but like the timing of cartoon into stop motion 
Yeah. Yes. We uh, we were really inspired by uh, George Paul, and George Paul is known for his very cartoony stop motion. Uh, uh, George Paul uh, is, is is an animator from a long time ago. Uh, he also worked uh, in the Netherlands, uh, doing the very old Philip cartoons and other uh, other uh, commercials. Uh, and he used replacement uh, puppets, and he was really a uh, squash and stretchy, and it was really funny to look at, and it was really cartoony. And we wanted that too, but we immediately knew that uh, it wasn't possible to do squash and stretch with wooden blocks because then you would lose uh, the authenticity of the material that you really see it's wooden blocks and uh, we really took care that it looked like wooden blocks if we would deform them or replace them with squash and stretchy blocks it would not work. So we decided to have the moving uh, limbs with space that in between and we could play with that. So we could, uh, we, we could change the amount of space between the blocks so we could actually squash them and stretch them without yeah, deforming yeah, the blocks. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, yeah. and we named the show after George Paul. Yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah. Now, I, 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 yeah. Now, now you explain it. It was in my mind, but I didn't make the, 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 the clue uh, <laughs> yet. <laughs> this is George. Right, we're going to watch a clip. And this is Paul. They are best friends and live in a world made of wooden blocks. With these blocks... They can build anything they want. Wow, George! Oh, no! Quick, Paul! Put it back together! Oh, come on, George! George and Paul. Really beautiful. All right, I, I don't have much material on, on this project, but uh, maybe it's interesting because it's a bridge from George Paul to uh, another feature film project that you did. Um, the Lummels, can you tell us like a bit about this project? The Lummels is also, uh, it's actually a, a TV series and uh, it's also for the Efteling. And uh, for all the Dutch viewers, I think they know uh, the Laven, which is a part of the theme park. And uh, it's usually the part that's really quiet, where you go and sit uh, to... Uh, In those snails cren- going like... Yeah, uh, yeah. Uh, you go there to eat your crentable. <laughs> and, uh, and, and if you have really tiny kids, you go on the snail, which is this like monorail cycle uh, thing. And the Efteling, they wanted to... Uh, re-energize that part and they thought of this concept of uh, the kids from the, the Laven which they called Lummels because everything uh, starts with an L in the <laughs> Laven universe <laughs> uh, so they thought of these Lummels who all they were born in the Efteling yeah, there's a whole huge lore of, of the Laven who used to live in I think Greenland until uh, ice came there and it got, became all icy and they went into the ground uh, be- because they wanted to be closer to the core of the earth where it was still warm. Lava. And lava, which is also with an L. <laughs> <laughs> and and uh, they were they were centuries down there and they, they traveled the world and every, everywhere where they go, went up there was this they left this volcano, which is like a like a mole's hope for lava. They they climb out there and they left the volcano, and they also left this L button uh, because they had an adventure there with the local people, and they said that if you ever need help, uh, you can push this L button, and then we will come. Uh, and so they they traveled the world through the through the ground through the lava tunnels for centuries, and then. Uh, they came up from the ground in the theme park, the Efteling, and they heard a laugh, a laugh, and they said, oh, this is a nice place to live. And then they had enough uh, adventure, adventure. For, for their whole lifetime. So that's why they are so lazy in the Efteling. But the kids, they never had these kind of adventures. So the show was about uh, these kids traveling around the world and responding to these uh, people around the world using the L button 
to ask for their for their help. Sounds logical with an L. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> But it was very fun to make. Yeah, I can imagine. Yeah, yeah. I think for like uh, for the animation industry, theme parks like the Efteling, with their own television channel and with their own merchandise and all their uh, uh, um, how do you say it? Um, theme park attractions that are there, it's a really good client for animation and animators in in the in the Netherlands, of course. Um, that brings us to a feature project. Um, so you did like series, several series, and then a feature uh, project from a famous cartoon character, uh, with originally from Belgium called Urb Urbanus, which is also um, a stand-up com stand comedian, uh, comedian uh, uh, doing shows, live shows, uh, and he made some films. And uh, one of the comic books of uh, comic books is also one of uh, of the way he finds his stage. Um, but I can imagine doing series and a feature film. Was it your first feature project, like this kind of full-length production? We worked on uh, Pim and Pom, which we, who also had a feature film uh, as storyboarders. Uh, and, but... and we were storyboarding already on Heinz at the time, I think. Yeah, yeah. yeah. but but uh, not uh, not directing. Uh, and also here, I think we got lucky in a way that you are at the at the right place at the right time we we uh with the grobe bolle and the uh, the 3d machine we uh have worked with george and paul and george and paul we worked with uh, uh, two writers uh, mark veerkamp and jimmy simons and uh jimmy simons uh is from belgium and he got a new job. He, he went to work at iWorks and they were thinking about uh, doing mm -hmm. animation. And he kept saying to his boss, uh, we have to work with Joost and Eric, they're so nice. We have to work with Joost and Eric, they're yeah. so on nice. On every project that they, that they pitched, he said, we should do this with Joost and Eric. So that became really annoying Your sales department is amazing, right? So <laughs> yeah. You don't hire them, but they sell you everywhere. Yeah, so so they at iWorks they be, became uh, Peter Bukar became really annoyed by this, and he said, uh, "Bring him over and be done with it," <laughs> because they were thinking about doing an Urbanus feature, which uh, is logical to do with a Belgian director. But uh, he, even though uh, he wanted to talk to us, so we went to uh, iWorks. And we had a conversation about Urbanus and we showed uh, our work and how we uh, do things, how I think, we work. I think we already made a little test as well. That's, that's also a good tip, always <laughs> make a little animation. <laughs> so you want a feature film, here's already a clip. <laughs> make people enthusiastic. Yeah, and yeah. then it really clicked. So uh, yeah, he started off saying like, okay, we want to make this feature film. Uh, and Jimmy said, I should talk to you but uh, it's probably going to be funded here in Belgium with Belgian money. So we probably cannot hire you, but I want, still want to talk to you about what you think. And he ended the conversation like, okay, uh, this was really nice. Let's see how we can make this work. <laughs> but it's, uh, so that's uh, I, and, and But that's a lot of work, like doing this. There are like just a few feature films made in, in the Netherlands. Netherlands industry uh, is, is yeah, it's it's getting better and better and bigger and bigger and doing bigger projects all the time. But it's in the past 10, 15 years that things are like evolving like this. Um, yeah. So I can imagine for a studio like a Ching, this is a big project. Um, so how how long was were you working on this uh, feature? I think from two thousand seventeen, uh, and we finished uh, premiere was February two thousand nineteen. Uh, and you had to translate it in from a comic into more animatable characters. Is this like an example about like how you are like the things are changing? So these are kind of director notes probably, or like character designer notes, or making it more animatable. What what's was that difficult for you to translate the cartoon into more doable designs for uh, feature animation? Well, the no. thing is, uh, yeah. well, the thing is, uh, Urbanus was having about 180 comic books at that time. He started off 20, 30 years ago uh, together with Willy Lindhout. And um, he really evolved 
uh, in his style. And he also changed inkers as well, for people who ink his comic. And that also changes the look of his comic books. And it's, yeah, we, we had to really find a way of how does Urbanus and the other characters look. And they often didn't match uh, in, from comic book to comic book or even from page to page. So we had to make, uh, to make that uh, on one level to make a unity out of that. So it was basically, we were doing these model sheets. First, we, we were looking for all kind of images from the books that we like, put them together. Then we redraw them or we did it with uh, Digna and also with uh, Digna van der Put and with Kenny Rubinis. And then uh, Willy Lindhout, the original creator of the comic books, he gave us feedback about it. Uh, yeah, because it's important now. for those who not animate, if you translate an illustration into more animated, because from every angle, it looked like uniform, right? So every animator should have the same design, otherwise nose will change during a, an during a motion or it will be yeah. off, uh, off the, the actual design. So um, that's the reason why they do this redesigning. Uh, and you were also involved like doing a lot of storyboard, everything, right? Involved in uh, the translation. Yeah, yeah. yeah as, as bigger the, the project becomes, uh, the more distant from the creative process in a way you get as a director, because if, a, if, if we're doing a really small project, Joost and I can do it together, or maybe if it's a bit bigger project, uh, we get get a few people, but when it's such a, a massive production like this, uh, yeah, you you need to find uh, the perfect team uh, to work together with. So how we usually work is uh, we try we initiate a project with the two of us, or we go to a client who wants a project, and we do little tests and. Uh, models and uh, with the, just the two of us and when we get the project uh, and it goes into production or pre-production then we hire all these uh, really talented artists to work together with us because uh, if you do it right you hire people that are specialized in one thing and in by that they are better at you in that specific thing and I think uh, if, if, if we talk about, about ice skaters, we are all rounders and, uh, <laughs> and we get sprinters and long distance skaters uh, on, on every specific part. So uh, we, we know what we want because we, we initiated it and, and thought about the philosophy and then we get a really talented artists to level it up. Yes. Okay, we're gonna watch a little part of the animatic. Ik ben Igor de Roes en ik maak jullie allemaal rijk. Stinkend rijk. Wat is dit voor smeerlapperij? Oh ja, gelukkig zijn we allemaal rijk. Dat kan toch zomaar niet? Revalidatie! Laten we wat gaan drinken in het café. Lomzakken, ben de plusjes gaat konijnen. Hela, geen lelijke woorden gebruiken in een tekenfilm. Lafette, we kunnen de regels in een gat steken. Urbanus, het vuile goud. Oh, it, it's really funny to watch your uh, uh, animatic because the animations are quite a few keyframes already. You can actually, uh, you can already animate it. In a, in a sense, it's limited animated. Uh, so yeah. timing is already done. So as an animator, you just have to make some great, great keys in betweening, and it's straight. Uh, so everything is thought out quite thoroughly already. Yeah, and and what what made this project very special is, like we said with the earlier project, we could work together with uh, experienced Canadian studios and uh, all these wonderful people from the saloon that we met, but. With such a project, uh, if it's funded in Belgium and it's funded in uh, the Netherlands, you have to work with Dutch and Belgian artists. So uh, that that changed a lot uh, because we had uh, the Dutch anima animators in our studio, and uh, there's a small group. Well, I think about five animators in in Belgium, which you 
constantly uh, uh, have to direct. And I think that was a huge step uh, for us as a as a studio. All right. We'll see some more artwork over here. A lot of work, I can imagine, like like ninety minutes. It's like. Uh... Is it it's like a risky thing to do? I can imagine also budget wise and get all the work done in that amount of time. Is it like, or are you so trusting in the team that you're setting up together and it's so well organized that? I think, I think we are really like pleasers. <laughs> so there's always too little time and there's always uh, not enough money, but like everybody wants to make a great project. And then in the end you do a lot of work that you, that you end up not getting paid for, but you really want to make uh, the, the film as, as, as good as possible. All right, we're gonna watch the final clip and then we go to a next project. What's funny about this clip is uh, the character, the dog, Nabucco Donosor. He's, uh, he's from the comic and he walks on, 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 on slippers, on pantoffles. And uh, he has that on four feet. But uh, as soon as he stands up, he, he has hands. <laughs> and we had to translate that into the movie. And uh, Alien van der Heide did that very well here uh, uh, in this scene. Because you don't really notice it if you don't know it, but it's... It was kind of, how are we going to do this? I want to see it again. Now you're saying yeah, it, now it I'm going to watch at it. Look at the hands. I can ruik een vers Russisch zweetvoetenspoor. Clever solution. Oh, when he walks, he has... <laughs> yes. <laughs> so that's one of the translation parts of the comic book that we had to deal with. And there were many more like that, of course. But Nice so. solution. Now we go to the Tom Des Tides. Um, yeah, first we're gonna watch a little clip. Um, what I'm trying to do also in this interview is to go to the different kind of steps uh, of, of the production. So how you, how you guys got together, how you form teams, skills, experience, and from series into features. And now after seeing this clip, I want to talk a little bit more about like the style Bible and the importance of it. Um, first a little clip so people... Heeft u die tand gestolen, meester? Geleend! Ga je mee op een bizarre reis door de geschiedenis? Ik ga de poort naar het verleden openen. Af en zo, voort en En u bent? Haaien Diesel. Eh, Haaien... Geen geintjes over mijn naam! De tand! Stuur hem terug! Om zo! Wat is dit? Om zo! Wat is dat? Paul! De tand destijds. Morgen in Zeppios. All right. Because there is like this saying that like animation takes a lot of time, but the whole pre-production also takes a lot of time because you have to think about everything. And then the animators, they actually make it come alive, but the whole world is already built, right? And uh, it's directed, the story's written and all the designs are there. It's sold. So there's money, there are producers, there's a team. So I can imagine to direct and make it happen and make it all like, uniform and end up in a film at the end at a certain moment in the premiere um you have to do a lot of research and make structured things and and uh so what what's called in the animation industry is a so-called style bible and it was really nice that in the material that you sent me for this interview there was this style bible of uh, the tantes tides or the tooth of time i really don't know if that's the correct title in no, english it's but the uh, test of time i, I did my yeah um and so research is a really important one in, in this project uh, because it's about history and like uh, traveling, time traveling. Um, can, you t can you tell us a little bit like how you use style Bibles and how, uh, how research works uh, among you two? This, this project uh, is actually quite funny because we really needed uh, a new pool of people and we really needed structure because uh, what happened is that you sometimes you are pitching very long to get something off the ground and then all of a sudden it's it, you get a green light or it's never going to happen or it takes years and years. Uh, so you start multiple projects and at a certain moment we were working on Heinz the feature film uh, as a studio 
uh, we were working on Urbanus and we got green light for this film as well. So we were doing three feature films at the same time. Uh, so we needed to expand, but also the group of people we work with uh, on some parts and, uh, and we needed structure. And we really like to work with uh, Jelle Gijsbert, uh, who's an illustrator. We, we work with him for, for many, many years. He was also in our class at the Willem de Koning Academy. And uh, Jelle made uh, some really cool designs, uh, but we needed a big team. We had over 900 backgrounds needed for this show, for this uh, film. It's a direct-to-TV uh, feature film. And uh, uh, we started working with Leo de Weiss, who was the, who teamed up with Jelle Gijsbert as art director to uh, yeah to, to basically take everything off Jelle's designs and, and and our wishes and create a bible for it, so that everybody who who we would hire to work on this film uh, would know what to make. And Leo yeah. really really took everything out of what Jelle did because Jelle did it very much on his feeling and on what we discussed, and we were very much on the same level. But Leo really, he, uh, he took it all out and he made uh, mathematical formulas on it, and it re really became science. Uh, so it would become very easy to point out what was wrong because it didn't follow the rules. Uh, as yeah, so the design structure, I think, really started with, uh, with the character designs. Uh, it, wa it was a feature film with a really small budget and a really short uh, production time. So we made character designs like these uh, and we thought we need to make these character designs simple and they need to mean something. And they, uh, for example, uh, the father you see here, Menno, uh, his body is shaped like an hourglass and that's too... Uh, two triangles and uh, the, the Sam next to him is his son and he's also a triangle but his head is flipped the other way around because they are uh, opposites they have a, a conflict and with with this philosophy we stepped to Jelle and he, he did the, the, the houses that you see also in it in this picture and so we decided that all the triangle people, they live in the triangle houses and all the square people live in the square houses and all the round people live in the round houses. And he did a lot of these designs, uh, taking that idea of these shapes and um, making really cool uh, location designs. And then what Jo said, Leo came in to structure uh, these ideas into a specific philosophy. So yeah. everything is made out of uh, triangles and squares and, and circles. Yeah, and and, and, and and just to not not to sound bored with this question, but it's interesting. Like with facts and figures, wise. So how many people? When you are saying three features at the same time, producing, directing, or like in their several stages, how many people are you trying to direct in the right direction? Uh, what are we talking about? Like 50, 60? Is this cartoon saloon 80, uh, what you mentioned before? How many people are working for Kaching at that time then? I, I think hi, the animation of Heinz was just finished for us as studio. We did 20 minutes of that film. And then uh, those people could work on the test of time because it was similar in technique. Uh, and then we had another team working on, uh, or multiple teams, working on the on Urbanus, but I think in total it's 40, 50, I think, oh, wow. at that time. Yeah. Uh, but not all in our studio, of course. There were Belgians working on it. They all work in Belgium. And uh, we had a lot of people who would come in the studio once or twice a week, and the rest of the week they would work from home, and then we would change that yeah. every day. What, yeah. what are... What, sorry, what I really like uh, also to see on this style Bible and how you explained the productions uh, before here is like the, and also the animatics, it's so efficient, right? So if, if, the, if the animatic is really clear, if like the world building is really clear, so you know what exact with the shapes, what the philosophy is behind those shapes, um, all, the, all the research is done in the style Bible, so they know exactly how the world would look like, 
uh, where the inspiration comes from. So you already have a good, in, in, uh, how do you say, overview on the atmosphere you're trying to achieve. Um, so in that sense, just to use George and Paul as, as, as a kind of a metaphor, all the building blocks are there and you give them to the animators and they can play around with it and, and make it come alive. Is, is that a bit like how you approach big chunks of production into smaller chunks so that it works for smaller teams in a fast pace? Yeah. So I, I... really, really a tight animatic. So uh, all the all the decisions are made there. And then with, when, when it's really a tight uh, uh, deadline, uh, we, we lock the animatic and then we just keep it uh, so so that you know what you're gonna make and then you can also budget and uh, and plan on it and plan on that yeah and this is like was a funny slide i think and then we go to the to the shorts because you make big projects but you also make shorts um and, and this is like a good example about like how those style bibles work right because this was a yes. kind if i'm explaining it right this was a test to check out how different designers would uh, read this style bible and what would come out of it yes yeah we needed uh, about 900 backgrounds for this film we already had the animatic so leo made a list and we knew what to do uh based on the animatic leo would team up uh with with people to to make a a, a layout which you see on the right corner and uh yellow made made a big image on top and so we knew how it should look and then we uh, we send it out as as test to people to see can does it work does the style bible work uh, and is it clear enough and if we give this test to people will they make something totally different or will it look alike and we were very very surprised to see that we uh, these were just eight people that we had eight potential background uh, designers here because uh, there are differences in there but uh, they all look very much alike and that's. Yeah. Uh, in that sense, it works as a kind of a recipe, right? Like a, a, cook, a, a cookbook yes. for, for a recipe and then see where you can make the same dish and it all tastes the same, which is... Uh, yes. So, so when we saw this, we were like, okay, this will work. Any of these people could make them. Uh, some of them, of course, you, you can give some direction, say we want this always like this. Or, but it was very clear that it would work. And yeah. that's... Uh, and even though they, they look the same, there, there are tiny differences. And if you work some time with an artist, you also learn what their specific uh, talents are. So you so you think, oh, he's really good at uh, like uh, super good angles, and the other one is even better at shapes or at colors. So you you during the project you get to learn all the artists, and you say, ah, you can take this scene because you're good at that. You can take that because you are good at that. And the same. The same with uh, with with animation. Uh, you learn that one animator, even though they're all good, you know that one is really good at action scenes and the other one is really good at emotional scenes. And even though to the audience it's, it all looks the same, like uh, because then we did our job correctly, uh, you do you do give certain things to certain people because because of their talents. Yeah. Hey and. Big projects, uh, I can also imagine like really strict style Bibles doing ultra shorts, which already explains what it is. It's an ultra short uh, film. Um, you, did, you did a few. Um, this is one of the projects called Inked. Um, where does the, yeah, this is like some inspiration sketches, but where did the inspiration come from? Yeah, uh, for the idea. Yeah, well, we wanted to do ultra courts for a long time. Uh, we never did one uh, because we were always busy. And after uh, 2019, where all the features were finished, we decided uh, we want to do want to take a little step back and have some rest, some more holidays at that time. Uh, so we did, and uh, and we were in our studio developing new stuff. So short films, series, longer films. Uh, just the two of us developing new films. And uh, we also said we want to make an ultra court. So uh, we decided, uh, we came up with this idea and pitched it or submitted it at the film fund uh, because it's a, it's a contest. 
uh, and we got it. But the idea came from uh, that we wanted to make a stereoscopic film because it's made for theater. And uh, we thought it would be fun to have a short stereoscopic film in the cinemas. Uh, and then we came with the idea of what works well in stereoscopic and what doesn't work well. And we think it always works really well in uh, in a theme park because it's short. And if it's short, you can have the 3D effect. You can, there's always a level of how far the 3D effect is. Is it really heavy? Then it looks really cool, but it's very tiring for your brain and your eyes. So at a feature film, they, they put the level of the amount of 3D low because then you can last it for the whole film and you cannot switch all the time. So we thought, okay, if we make a short film, we can go use really, really cool 3D. And what works, what also works well is if you look through a window that works always works well. If something is cut off, it doesn't work well. Fast camera movements, they don't work well. And then we came up with this idea. We look through the glass of an aquarium. So it's all really far away. So you can see that depth. Uh, we don't have cutoffs or almost not. Uh, we don't have any camera moves. We're all going to shoot it from one shot. And then we came up with the idea of uh, what can we show if, we, if we're going to look at uh, one shot and we don't want to move the camera uh, and we want to look far into the distance. Uh, then we came up with the idea of an uh, aquarium. And then we only needed to think of a story that happens there. Yeah, so we had a... Uh... The idea that the screen would be the, the glass wall of the aquarium. And we knew that if we have a glass screen, it needs to break at some point. <laughs> and uh, so, and then we thought of what character could live in this aquarium that's fun to animate. Because the first thing you think about is, of course, a fish. But we uh, then we thought of an octopus. And we thought visually that would have a lot more... Uh, uh, fun to have with with all the tentacles you can uh, you can animate and have these really nice cool uh, uh, well silhouettes and uh, and gags with uh, which was also really painstaking for the for the animation because uh, yeah I'll, if you watch the film later if you show a bit uh, you actually see here that he has eight tentacles but in the in the film he does not <laughs> because it's too much, and also we during the designing we we discovered that eight is visually not so pleasing, and six looks a lot nicer for the eyes. Uh, but also it make to make it a tiny bit more easy for the for animator. animator. Yes, <laughs> yeah, all the because designs you... were done by uh, Jelle Geisberg again. Right. The background and the character designs. So yeah, that's uh... and, and if you see octopuses in in animation. They are also always either in 3D movies because of the tentacles or in, like in The Little Mermaid, uh, they do not have uh, suction cups <laughs> <laughs> because all these suction cups need to be animated and moved and which was really uh, painstaking. Good idea on paper and uh, a bad idea for an animator. <laughs> yes. yes. <laughs> oh yeah, and, and then we had this, the, 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 we had, uh, this nice idea and we had... We, uh, we had this story, and we really kept it simple, and then we thought, okay, now we need to storyboard it, and it's, it's now very simple, but now we need a lot of gags, and it needs to be really funny. And then uh, we, we, start, we contacted Wilbert Pleinaar, uh, who is known as a, uh, as a story artist for, for making lots of gags, adding lots of gags into, in, into the projects he works on. And uh, Wilbert was kind of retired at that time. And we knew Wilbert worked in Hollywood and we knew we never could pay him his Hollywood wages, but we knew him a bit and we thought, well, maybe he just thinks it's fun. And, uh, and that was true. He said, I didn't draw for two years and I kind of wanted to get back. So uh, this would be a nice starting point for me to do. Uh, and we said, well, we have this story and we can we need to make it visually interesting and add lots of gags and we want to do that with you and it was really nice to work with uh, with him yeah 
for those who don't know, Wilbert Plana worked like what you mentioned in Hollywood on several films like uh, Ice Age and uh, How to Train a Dragon. So big Hollywood productions in animation. Yeah, um, pretty much. If there are funny scenes in those movies, there's a big chance that uh, Wilbert did them. Yeah. yeah. And if a film wasn't funny, they hired Wilbert to make it funny in a sense, yes. right? So, uh, yes. Or if they have like, he's also kind of a spin doctor in storytelling, right? Uh, now yes. and then. Yeah, and a gag polisher. I thought the, the official term was for. Is, is it called he, gag polisher? I, maybe it's just a term that was created for him. <laughs> but he, he, he has the talent to make unfunny jokes very funny. So he <laughs> polishes the jokes. <laughs> hey, and, and these are like the both protagonists, the octopus and the cleaner. Um, and so a lot of beautiful designs over here. Um, and, and of course, like some audience and the fishes who are also like part of the, 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 the habitat of the octopus, of course. Here you see some beautiful designs of it. And then like how to make this world beautiful. So like uh, with a beautiful color palette. Yes, it's very hard because uh, you don't want to make everything blue, but you kind of want to. <laughs> uh, so we kind of were worried how we're going to do that. And we ended up with making everything blue, bluish, uh, and also make that part of the story because uh, the octopus is a neat freak. And in the beginning of the movie, there are lots of other fish, and they're making mess with shells, and uh, and those are colors, and those are unwanted for him. So we kind of played with that. He wants it blue and fresh. Yes. yes. Yeah, and here here we can see an example of how to make it 3D, right? Yes, we, we, we made it stereoscopic 3D in After Effects. So we kind of did all the layers. Uh, yeah, we put it all in layers and uh, we watched it with 3D glasses on while compositing. And uh, yeah, we could so move we, these yeah. layers. So basically you make a shoebox uh, theater, uh, but in the computer, all these flat elements that you uh, put behind each other to make it uh, stereoscopical. Yeah. Yes, you... but also the film was uh, released in cinemas as a short film ahead of a, a blockbuster movie. But uh, later we got hit by the, the corona pandemic and the film went to a lot of festivals uh, and did very successful there. But all these festivals were mostly online and it didn't screen anywhere in 3D version, <laughs> <laughs> which is too bad. Yeah. But uh, luckily everybody enjoys it in 2D as well even though the concept and everything came from the initial idea of making it in 3D. All right. but, uh... hey, here's a little clip. That animatic, already really yes. clear animatic. Yes, this was by Wilbert Kleiner. Yeah. Oh, he made the animatic as well. So... The yeah. storyboard, yeah, the panels, yeah. yeah. And here you, you can see a line test of the octopus, a little bit more animated as well. Yeah, we did uh, use two totally different techniques for the two characters. So the, as you can see, the octopus is uh, animated by Digna van der Put in a traditional way. And uh, the cleaner is animated uh, in a digital cutout uh, by uh, Jeffy Hartley. So it's really nice to see how it comes from a simple idea for an ultra short into a stereoscopic 3D, 2D, 2D slash 3D uh, uh, kind of production. Hey, and I think that like uh, it tastes for more. So the ultra shorts, is it also a way for you to experiment a bit? So I can imagine these big projects are really like a big ship that has to uh, go to the destination. I can imagine that like this ultra short for you is also play around a little bit with storytelling and with, with animation and different techniques. Is it also how you approach these kind of projects? Yeah, I think because you think uh, after the feature films, we thought, ah, we're going to do an ultra short and it's going to take us a ultra short amount of time because uh, <laughs> we, we, did, we did all these long projects. But what's really nice about such a short film is that you can really uh, polish it. Uh, you can work on on 
on all these tiny details for a long time and, and really make the gags funnier and make the animation as nice as possible. Where there's this danger, I think, with feature films because they need to be finished at some point and they are such a huge amount of work that it becomes a bit of a like a big machine, a train that that moves. Uh, and uh, yeah, yeah, you have this big goal of getting the film finished uh, in time for it to be in the cinemas. And what's really nice with the short film is that you can really take the time and attention uh, to to focus in, on the really tiny details and get them right. right. And yeah. and we were much more hands on by doing things ourselves on on the ultra shorts uh, yeah. during production. So you did another one. It's it, this is working title, but in in the end it was like Kunstuk, and I really don't know the English title for it. Piece of art. Yeah. Piece of art. Sorry, yeah. piece of art. Um, so here are some beautiful drawings. Um, your drawings of the main protagonist. Can you tell me a bit about the story Can, uh, without like uh, uh, spoiling, of course, but like uh, what's the initial idea? Uh, the initial idea was that where with ink we look uh, into a fish tank and with this uh, ultra short we also wanted to do something with the screen uh, and we thought of wouldn't it be cool to uh, see uh, 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 a robber come into a museum and to steal a, a, a piece of art, but seen through the piece of art itself, so a POV film. So from the perspective of the piece of art itself. Yeah. Yes, yeah. It's, it's like you are behind the painting and you look into the museum and when somebody, when the crook, he grabs the, the painting, uh, it's like when you film yourself with a, with your cell phone, you get this really weird uh, perspective thing the whole time, and you go, and you we can play with the uh, with uh, the edges of the screen, which are the which are the sides of the painting. That's that's what the initial thought was. Yeah. Hey, and in these kind of films, with your experience from. Uh... When the Koning working together to Cartoon Saloon, doing features, series, ultra shorts. Um, what is that for you? I think uh, what's the most important. I, if you if you would look back, what is the thing that you learned? The, yeah, the most I don't think is a good English sentence, but like what really sticks to you? What you say? Okay, in the past years, doing animation productions, this is for me like the most the most worthful uh, learning point. To, to me, it would be that you find a way uh, to distance yourself from the project a couple of times. Uh, because when you work really hard on a project, it's very easy to get uh, like this, uh, how it's called? Tunnel, tunnel vision. vision. Because this, you need to finish it, you work really hard, you want it to be great. And uh, you make this animatic, which you have seen a thousand times. And at some point, maybe you stop seeing what it actually is because you have seen it so many times. Uh, it's really easy to start timing the animatic too fast because I have seen it, especially with a, with a feature film. You, it, it, it's really a chore to watch one, on, one and a half hour of animatic. And you go, like, I Every already time. know this, I already know this, I already know this. And then it's really easy to start cutting, 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 but that's not how the audience uh, perceives the film because they see it for the first time. Uh, and I think that's that that goes for pretty much all the phases. Also, after animation, it, it would be the best if you if if there's a possibility to to go on a holiday before you turn in the film uh, <laughs> to clear your brain come back, see the film again, and then you are more able to see what's not right yet and uh, have some time to fix it. And uh, for you, Joost? Uh, everybody who knows me and Eric uh, know that we always have the same opinion about things and it's also because <laughs> we discussed it uh, many times, but that's that's very much true. <laughs> what Eric said, it's... Uh, it, 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 it's having the ability to step back and watch it again 
Uh, also, and always, because uh, there are a few things that we always like to do, but we always want to make the best thing. And we like to work with people who also think that way. And I think we work a lot of times with a lot of the same people. We did uh, the second ultra quit again with Jelle Gijsbergs and also with Wilbert on the storyboards uh, because we all want the same and we listen to each other. Uh, we don't say, I I created this and maybe your idea is better, but I'm the director. It's, uh, it's, it's listening to each other because the end result is what matters most. And yeah. uh, furthermore, we always try to think what is best for the film in terms of concept. Uh, we don't just really do something. We always try to think of why is this shaped in a certain way? Why is this colored in a certain way? Is this the best for, for the film? And that's... Yeah. Uh, and, so. and what I think also is maybe, uh, yes, that's for the people maybe to say, but what what is <laughs> unique with us is that we wear a lot, a lot of different hats, like some people are animators, some people are uh, designers, and we do a bit of everything and also producing. Be and because we are also producing and line producing our own films, we, we know what the constraints are and, and we find ways to work within these uh, constraints. So we're not a director who wants the impossible or, or uh, we're not a producer who say this cannot happen because uh, because we wear both hats, producer and a director, there's a nice balance where we can say, hey, we can do this to make it better or, uh, but we're not, we're not going overboard uh, in, in a zone where it's not even possible to make the project anymore. Yeah. Thank you so much, uh, Kaching, uh, Joost and Erik for sharing all your knowledge, your beautiful art. Um, thank you so much for explaining so much and taking the time for this interview and sharing it with our audience. Thank you so much. Uh, and I also want to thank the audience back home in the chat for joining us in this episode of Playgrounds TV with Catching Cartoon. Um, hope to see you next time. Thank you so much. And please give a big clappity clap for Catching Cartoons in the chat. See you next time. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. <laughs>